Hello everyone and welcome back to my tutorial campaign in Realistic Progression Zero, the campaign mod for the Realism Overhaul suite of Realism mods for Kerbal Space Program. In the last episode we designed our uh, new command module and service module. Uh, and then in this episode we're actually going to test it for reals. Um, I did a bit of tweaking uh, to the stats for the pod uh, for re-entry. Um, so I feel rather more comfortable about it now. Uh, however, it's probably worth one more quick check. Um, because, of course, I tweaked it once again in the CFG before restarting KSP for this. Now, I should note that I did finally take the suggestions uh, of some various viewers and what I had talked a little bit about doing uh, and that is remaking it with a narrow service module. And the advantage of doing it this way is that that structural piece is lighter than it otherwise would be which saves us some delta which, which gives us about 25 meters per second extra delta V. I also went ahead and added some extra oxygen to the capsule such that we now have 16 days of oxygen so we'll be able to um, survive a little bit longer. Now you'll also you know the, the ablator is rather more than it was before. Um, given that the regular lunar heat shield of 3 meters diameter, this is 2.8 meters, is 563 kilograms of ablator. Uh, it would be, I think I calculated 490 or so, maybe 450 uh, for 2.8 meters. So that's undercutting it some. So again, it's, it's less effective than the regular lunar heat shield, but um, it should be effective enough for our purposes. That's, that's what matters. So, we're going to go ahead and test a re-entry in this. Now, we don't actually need any of this other stuff. So, let's go ahead and get rid of this. That makes it cheaper. The launch escape system is only 500 funds. It's not even a million dollars. It's not even, sorry. Yeah, it's not even a million dollars. Alright, so let's add a couple launch clamps. and simulate you. Let's go for 15 minutes. We're kind of hemorrhaging money at the moment. But we do have enough to at least get some stuff into the air. It's really worrying. I maybe should not have spent so much on R&D upgrades because it's really worrying how low on money we are. But once we actually have this thing ready, we'll do a human space flight mission uh, and that will quickly get us our money back. It'll more than pay for that launch and a few more launches. Alright, so we are now in orbit. Let's give us a realistic setup there. Now, velocity. We want 3500 Let's try 3600 prograde. We'll have a little bit extra. And. That's a bit sharp. 40 kilometers. For, well, 41.47 kilometers is going to be our periapsis. So turn these on, turn descent mode on. And let's get cracking. <laughs> um, right. Surface, we're at. So this is faster, I believe, than the fastest Apollo return. So that should give us a reasonable estimation of whether we survive. I think we want pitch about like this. Turn on 
find controls, and in we go. Now, we're going to have to perform a rather interesting maneuver once we get down low. We're going to have to roll entirely inverted once our vertical speed drops below a sync rate of 50 meters per second. Um, because it's about to get bad. All right, we're riding that heat gauge. We gotta keep rolled level. All right, we have now gone positive on our vertical speed, so let's roll inverted. Now the reason for that is otherwise we will skip right the heck back out of the atmosphere and we'll have an apogee of like 2,000 kilometers. And that means we'll complete a whole nother orbit. That's very bad. We don't want to do that. We want to stay within the atmosphere. We want to manage our... Yeah, so we want to basically stay right around here, right around 60 kilometers. Bleed off speed as fast as we can. Look at that ablator go. All right, now we want to roll. Whoops. Let's let the thing roll for it. Now, for some reason, this does want to spin on its own. It's really quite annoying. So the, I'm beginning to worry a little bit about the state of the ablator, but I think we'll be okay. Might need to tweak it a little bit in our settings files. Okay, so now we've gone below orbital velocity. And we're gonna we're gonna do a skip right now. So that we can not use up all our ablator. Okay. Almost back to sixty kilometers. We're gonna skip right back up until over eighty kilometers. And we're well below orbital velocity at this point. Almost a, We're about a kilometer per second below orbital velocity. Now, you may look at that ablator amount right there, and you may get worried. And I am a little bit worried myself. But I think we will be okay. Yeah, so we have 15 left, but we're below orbital velocity. So, you know, <laughs> don't have to worry so much. It's just not going to be that hot. We're going to go all the way up to about 90 kilometers. And, you know, I'm going to flip right now. Let's flip back. Roll inverted again. And... The reason I did this aggressive reentry, and you'll note that our max G was, it was only five and a half. That's actually a lower max G than Apollo's. Uh, might have, maybe should have gone even a little deeper. I don't know. Uh, you want a max G about six. Uh, all right, so we're now rolled inverted. We're, we're going to decrease off our vertical speed a bit extra, lower that apogee a bit. And we'll see how this goes. Now remember, that was faster than the fastest Apollo re-entry, by a fair amount. It's certainly faster than any re-entry we will be doing. 
we can we can perform a, a slower return if we really need to. Uh, save a good three to four hundred meters per second on entry than what I just did, so that will also be you know less aggressive than what we just went through. Uh, but the reason I did such an aggressive reentry was because I knew that the lift from this capsule is actually quite severe, uh, and you see that we despite rolling inverted a few, you know, and staying there and then rolling uh, out again, we still ended up with a skip re-entry. Um, and I, that's intended because I want the shield to radiate its heat out, cool off enough so that it's starting from a low temperature when we do our next dive. All right, now it's time to pop back on up. Come on, you. Get stable. All right. That's decent. We're still roll 15 degrees of roll. And we want to zero out our side slip as best as we can. We have one degree of side slip. That's acceptable less than a degree all right and we'll pull SAS on all right so now we'll do our our secondary entry uh, and yeah as I said I think I am gonna have to tweak this a little bit more because that's you know a worryingly low quantity of ablator to have remaining but again um, like you know I think we'll be okay, and we were doing a much faster re-entry than uh, we otherwise might. It's also worth, and I think I'll restart the simulation after this, and try a less aggressive perigee and see how that works, although I think that that will actually lead to a larger amount of ablator loss, which is why I had such an aggressive perigee. Okay, and you'll note that we've slowed down another 400 meters per second um, and haven't lost any ablator, really. So that's fine. So, all right, looks like we need to adjust our pitch a little bit. Oops, rolling the wrong way. Fine adjustments. All right, now we're beginning to pick up some flame again. Oops, that's rolled a bit far. And now we're beginning to lose some ablator. But that's fine, we're losing an acceptable amount of ablator. Yeah, look at how slowly we're losing it now. Yeah. Six kilometers per second is half the velocity that we entered at, give or take. Well, sorry, no, that's, that's a little bit more than half. Um, let's get down to 50, 600. That would be half the velocity we entered at. So half the velocity we entered at. Now, heating is proportional to the cube of velocity. So that's one-eighth of the heating. Now you can see why the ablator is... I'm losing so little of it because I'm only taking one-eighth of the heat that I took on my first entry. And that's just convection. We're not even talking about radiative heating. Because really, on a 
or low Earth orbit reentry, radiative heating is not really a factor. On a lunar reentry, it's about a third of the heat lo of the total heat load, if memory serves. So that that tells you, <laughs> yeah, it's it's really 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 hot stuff coming back from the moon. Yeah, so probably the best way to calculate, uh, and it's a shame that Deadly Reentry and other mods don't actually show this. I don't think maybe Trajectories does. Uh, the best way to figure out your reentry is probably to work off your entry angle, because the, the entry angle you want is going to be a function of your entry velocity, such that you don't skip out and don't have too high peak heating, and your ballistic coefficient, which basically determines how quickly you slow down, and uh, whether you're performing a lifting reentry, and if so, what your your lift to drag ratio is. Yeah, so we've got spare ablator, <laughs> as it happens. Um, yeah, so basically, the low the lower you are, if you can stand the peak heating if you can stand the the instantaneous heat flux you're getting the better off you are because uh as i has been mentioned by a lot of ksp commentators i i had a, like i think a, a uh the mathematics of reentry primer uh drag is broadly a function of the square of velocity and heating is a function of the cube of velocity it, um so that's that's one thing. You want to slow down faster, because the the faster you get to a slower velocity, uh, the less of an offset there will be between how much drag you're getting and how much heating you're getting. So that's one reason you want to get low faster. The other reason you want to get low faster is the effect that atmospheric density has. Drag is linearly proportional to atmospheric density. If it's one kilogram per cubic meter, then you get one kilonewton of, of drag. If it's 0.5, you get 0.5. Um, convective heating is a function of the square root of density. So if it's if density is 1, you'll get 1 whatever heating. If density is 0.5, you'll get 0.707 units of heating. Uh, so you can see quite immediately how important it is to not just sit in the upper atmosphere and bake. And that is why I performed that rather aggressive reentry. That is why I had such a low perigee, because I did not want to sit up there and bake and just lose ablator to that. The downside, of course, is that you don't end up being able to leverage radiative cooling as much because the higher you are, the less air there is that's radiating in against you, which means the more radiative cooling you can do. Uh, the space shuttle, for example, survived without any kind of ablating heat shield by means of staying high in the atmosphere where it could reach thermal equilibrium, where the heat coming in would heat up the tiles and then they'd radiate outwards. So... Yeah, on a lunar reentry, you can't really do that, both because if you stay too high too long, you'll just head right out of the atmosphere again. You need to be going low enough that you'll actually reenter, rather than just going out on another orbit. Uh, and also because the velocity is so great that you'll actually be getting radiative heating rather than radiative cooling. Uh, and so you don't want to be in that regime. All right, so... This was a this was a, a quite aggressive test, uh, a fairly successful one. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, restart the simulation, and we'll try a less aggressive perigee. That was I think that was what was that? That was about 40 kilometers, I think, 40, 41, something like that, was what I chose as my initial perigee. Um, Yeah, and it's worth noting that people talk about skipping out of the atmosphere, people talk about that being a skip reentry. It's really, it's not a direct analogy to skipping a stone across the water at all, because just that's not how it works. P 
people call it that because that's like the closest they could consider because if you think of the planet if you think of your relation to the planet surface as flat rather than round then it looks like you're skipping a stone out of water but if you remember that the planet is round then it doesn't really look like that at all um, the 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 issue of what's going on though and the reason why you can sort of get away with calling it that is because we are using the lift of the pod we went in deep and then we used the lift of the pod to get us out of the deep atmosphere again um, that's not to say that you can't do a re-entry with a purely ballist like you can't do a purely ballistic re-entry that doesn't go into the atmosphere leave the atmosphere and re-enter the atmosphere that's possible it's harder but it's possible uh, which means that the whole um, skipping thing doesn't quite work most of it's just orbital mechanics like if you have, say our orbit went like this, only went down to about 100 kilometers, then we'd go, even if we went in ballistic, we'd go in, we'd go out again, we'd go around, and we'd come back in again. Uh, that's really more like, uh, what would you call it? Uh, that, that's really more like an arrow breaking orbit than a skip re-entry. Uh, the reason that when you talk about Apollo, you talk about people worrying about the pod just skipping out of the atmosphere. Is not again not because it's it's skipping like a stone and it'll come back. It's because if you don't um, get low enough, then you'll run out of supplies as you complete your like, you know, eight hour or one day orbit that bring that finally brings you back. Um, that's the worry there. I mean, also the worry is that generally you can't. You, with those kind of orbits, with Apollo's orbit trajectories, to minimize time in the Earth's uh, radiation belts, they would come in much faster. And that's why, remember, that's why I went up of over 11 kilometers per second. Um, let's go ahead and do this. What did we, 3600, I think is what we chose. Up. And we want... Oh, that's way too high. Let's try 60. Whoa, nope. Okay, 60. Come on. Why is... There we are. Oh, this is going to be bad because I'm not going to get oriented properly in time. Okay. Good enough. So we're coming in to a quite high perigee. Our entry angle... Let's compute this. 34.74 angle of attack. Pitch is 39.6. So that's... 4.9 degrees? Yeah, 4.9 degrees entry angle. So that's a very shallow entry angle. I'm not even sure whether that's within Apollo's re-entry corridor. And again, we're coming in at 11.165, which I'm fairly sure is at least 100 meters per second faster than Apollo ever did. But I'm sure uh, that uh, pe <laughs> people who know their Apollo missions better than I can correct me on that one. All right, we just need to keep broadly aligned. Damp out any kind of... Okay, and I need to watch that speed like a hawk. Okay, so yeah, the, like I was saying, the, the, the skipping out of the atmosphere problem for Apollo was because, remember, we're still at escape velocity. So, 
if we came in really shallow, we would the Earth wouldn't slow us down enough. Because remember, when you're coming back from the moon, if you burn hard enough, you will escape the Earth-Moon system. Uh, and they did burn hard enough to do that. Whoa, whoops. I was, <laughs> was not paying attention to my vertical velocity, so this started a bit late. Yeah, and we're not getting enough to control it. That's bad. We're still gaining vertical speed despite all this, despite us having negative lift. Come on, get back aligned. There we are. Yeah, so we've gone up high enough that we're going to, in fact, do what people refer to as a as the we're skipping out of the atmosphere. Because look, we have this <laughs> a 13-hour orbit. All right, so I have to. We'll do this one more time. Uh, I have to be very, very. Uh, I really should like write a KOS program to do this or something. Because as soon as that vertical speed, the sync rate gets less than uh, 50, then I need to start that. Maybe even less than 100, just because of how fast it does that. All right, let's try this one more time. Um, simple 180. And 28.5.01.3600 up minus, let's go with finer control. And back, oh, whoop, wrong way. Come on. All right, 61. Well, that'll do. All right, so descent mode on. Tanks unlocked. RCS to on. Let's get aligned. And we come screaming in. Okay, I also have to remember to turn caps lock off when I perform the roll maneuver so I get the maximum thrust from those thrusters. Now it's possible, I did just update MechJet before launching this, and it's possible that, nope, it's, oh, no, that's right, okay. That is actually, it's calculating that right, I think. Okay, so in we go. Now we're at 88 kilometers, 87, 86, 5, 4. Okay. Descent rate is 600 meters per second. Let's also bring up the ablator display. 500. All right. I've turned caps lock off so I don't forget to later. 350 300 250 200 150 100. We're going to start our roll. Bingo. Nailed it. We're keeping our descent. Okay. And despite the fact that we are fully rolled inverted, we cannot control the fact that we're going back up, although we're going up very slowly indeed. Just because of how fast we're going. That's, that's overwhelming the aerodynamic forces that would ordinarily let us lower our vertical speed. 
So it's possible that that is simply too high a perigee to be viable. Yeah, I think that's going to end up being too high a perigee to be viable. Because, see, we're almost up to 100 meters per second vertical speed despite being inverted. Yeah, this is... And also, look at our ablator. We're almost to the same point we were before despite having an apogee of 20,000 kil kilometers. Oops, we rolled a bit far. All right, so this is... I think we do need to slam into the atmosphere, basically. Um, the one other thing we can try is we can actually slam in slightly more aggressively. Hit about a peak of 6 Gs. And... never actually skip all that high, although I wonder whether we might... that also might be worse in terms of app later. So, 180... Complex, 28.5.01... Velocity, 3600... Whoop, nope, wrong way. That's a bit much. Up. Minus 500. Whoop. Alright, let's try 31 kilometers, because why not? Alignment. I did turn descent. Yeah, I turned descent mode on. Good. Okay. All right. Now let's let's see whether we can survive the peak heating rate and not over temp. Caps lock back to on. Now it's about to get bumpy. Oh yes. Remember what I was saying about wanting to be lower so we decelerate faster and so that uh, the square root versus linear thing on density is not going to kill us. So let's see whether we can survive this heating rate. Alright. Yeah, that's that's a fairly high G-load. Not going to lie. 7.3. Alright, now we roll inverted. and hold it this altitude if we can. All right, it looks like now we can go ballistic. Or we can stay here for a while, decrease that sink rate. All right, now we'll roll again. Come back down again. All right, I think we can just actually let it go ballistic for now. All right, yeah, so this is ending up with less ablator use than before. That's for sure. Higher peak Gs. So you definitely can see, despite the fact... Oh, scary, scary, scary low perigee. You know, this is a super aggressive re-entry, except we're actually using less ablator than before. Um, 
you who try to do re-entries, even in stock Kerbal Space Program, that is a lesson that you need to learn. That it's not, it's not an intuitive lesson, but it is a lesson you need to learn in terms of how re-entry actually works. All right, I think now we can stay like this for a bit. Okay, now let's go back to ballistic. Uh, when I say let's go back to a ballistic entry, we're not really doing a ballistic entry. We're spinning, and that means that the lift forces will cancel each other out every revolution we do. So, in effect, over time, averaged, we're doing a ballistic re-entry. Because we, now we have some positive lift, then we're going to have some lift out to the side, then we're going to have some negative lift, then we're going to have lift out to the other side. Yep, look at that ablator. It's not really going to go much below 40. So, yeah. So, if we're at all in doubt about our re-entry velocity... Um, we can stay we can stay inverted in the upper atmosphere to push that perigee down and then we'll end up hanging around 50 to 47 kilometers instead of higher or instead of doing a skip back up to 80 kilometers and yeah okay so i feel i feel comfortable with this pod uh with its capabilities so we're going to go ahead and actually launch some stuff for real. Which is presumably what you've actually been waiting for. Although hopefully this, this section uh, was actually helpful to you in terms of your own lunar re-entries. Uh, we'll obviously do that for real at some point soon. But doing it for real doesn't mean we have the freedom... We, we wouldn't have the freedom of a simulation where I can try stuff out, where I can talk about different approaches. We can just reset the sim and try again. Uh, so hopefully this was, this was helpful to you. All right, so that's that's acceptable. Look at that, we're staying above 40. So the, the secret is, assuming your crew can take it, that's 7.5 Gs. Assuming your crew can take it, and assuming your shield can survive that peak heat flux, which I didn't even see what temperature we got to, but obviously we stayed under 3,000. Um, long as you can take that, it's better to, to do a lower perigee, higher G, and get the lower heat load, and therefore lower ablator use. If you don't have ablator, of course, if you're in the space shuttle, then obviously you have to take a different approach. Um, you have to try to do it in, in radiative equilibrium. But that's not an option for us on a lunar re-entry. Okay. So, coming up, we have the launch abort test. So let's warp to that. That was a long warp. Uh, in fact, it was such a long warp that we're going to have to do our first Jupiter fine-tune maneuver. <laughs> Before doing the other thing. Alright, so... For this, no crew aboard, we're going to do a separation at max Q, which is going to be, I think, fairly close to max G. Okay, so here's our version of Little Joe 2. It's using a, a full-up uh, LR-79 instead of anything else we might be doing. Um, it doesn't precisely replicate the first stage of either of our launch vehicles. But, but it does give us a decent amount of delta V. It gives us decent thrust-to-weight ratio. So let's go ahead and uh, I think we're going to want 80, 120, 
40 is fine. All right, engage the autopilot. And we're going to watch that dynamic pressure indicator. So up we go. Roll program initiated. Now I apologize that this is running at basically half speed. Um, that's because there's an issue with Pack Life Support where it's spamming the log every frame. As oh oh no, there is not. I don't know why we're running at half speed, given that uh, there isn't any aboard anybody aboard, so it's not a Pack Life issue. All right, so we're at 10,000 kilopascals dynamic pressure. Twenty thousand pascals dynamic pressure. I may go a little after max Q to have a fairly high thrust to weight ratio at the time. Thirty thousand kilopascals. No, I'm sorry. Thirty thousand pascals. What am I saying? <laughs> yeah, that would. Thirty thousand is like Venus or Jupiter. Thirty-seven. 38, max Q. Alright, we're going to go a little past max Q because I want us to have a high thrust to weight ratio at separation. Alright, when we get back down to about 30, let's go ahead and abort. Highly successful. Highly, highly successful. So... Whoa, that was bad. Um, evidently, our tower detach motors did not provide enough detachment. Uh, presumably because the drag was too severe. Uh, so, that seemed highly successful. So we're right about at Apogee. We've now started our descent. We're going to turn these on, turn descent mode on, and actually try to stabilize this thing and pretend like it's for reals. Okay. Let's roll properly. All right, and I think we're going to... Oh, ha ha ha! That's why everything's happening because autopilot was still engaged. I forgot that part. All right, so we're still subsonic. Yeah, so it, it is ironic that the launch vehicle we built for this looks a lot like Little Joe 2 with, with those fins and with it being short and stout. Um, the difference, of course, is that that was a liquid stage, and both the original Little Joe designed for Mercury and Little Joe 2 used for Apollo um, were clusters of solid motors. Uh, and li in Mercury's Little Joe case, they were four casters uh, with some recruits for extra liftoff thrust. And in the case of Little Joe Joe 2, I believe they were algols, which were used as, I think it's the first stage of the scout launch vehicle. Um, forget exactly what Little Joe 2 used. But basically, the, the main idea behind both the original Little Joe and Little Joe 2 is you design a super, super cheap, solid, entirely solid propellant launch vehicle. Because, of course, at that time, they didn't feel that solids were safe enough for crude spaceflight. Um, I think with some justification, frankly. Um, okay, we're coming up just about to shoot deployment. And you did so you design this, this launch vehicle that basically mimics the performance of the actual booster you're going to use. In Mercury's case, it was the Redstone. They basically quite precisely mimic the performance characteristics of the Redstone using... Um, 
little Joe's set of solid motors. Okay, we have Drogue full deployment, slowing down to about 80 meters per second, and we have main semi deployment and main full deployment. Okay. So, Little Joe 1 replicated closely the performance of, of Redstone. Uh, and it's worth pointing out, so Redstone is a bit of a misnomer. for what, So, the, that, that booster had a complicated history. Uh, originally, it was, I, I don't know what code name they used for it, but it was basically just a Super V2. It was a V2 with um, cylindrical propellant tanks, which meant that, that stage stretching was easier and design was easier, manufacturing was easier. Uh, okay, I guess that was the, the launch escape system all splashing down. Um, so it, it, it had a, a, an engine that was upgraded from what the V2 did, and it was redesigned with a cylindrical combustion chamber uh, with just a you know a standard set of injectors, right? So the the V2's engine had this this crazy thing of like 32 little tiny uh, injectors and mini combustion chambers, and then it had this large mixing chamber. Uh, so the the action so uh, when Rocketdyne, which was a division of North American Aviation, uh, they basically the first step that engine was. W I'm sorry, I'm going down lots of of tangents here but uh, it will all come together in the end. Um, so they ran a copy of the V2 engine, basically in their parking lot. Uh, the next step was to redesign it using American tolerances. The third step was to redesign it using those principles, but in a much more efficient manner, and that essentially gave us the Redstone's engine. Uh, it was called the NAA 75-110, basically, because it was 75,000 pounds of thrust and it ran for 110 seconds. Um, both of which were reasonable upgrades over what the V2's engine could do. It had a cylindrical combustion chamber, as I said, which is, is much simpler to manufacture. It just had, had standard injectors. It still ran off high test peroxide, uh, catalyzed into steam to act as the uh, gas generator to run the turbo pumps. Uh, they had not yet figured out how to burn the main propellants in a gas generator, that was the next phase. The next phase was was a built-in gas generator, um, still running on on Ethelox, and that was the original version of what we know today as the Atlas booster engine, the Thor Delta engine, you know, all these things. Um, yeah, and then eventually I switched it over to kerosene and liquid oxygen instead of ethanol and liquid oxygen, uh, and then finally the the thrust kept getting uprated and it was redesigned for Atlas after the cancelling of, of Navajo. Uh, and then also uses the Thor and Jupiter for stage engine. And, and there we are. Um, so anyway, so that's the engine. So Redstone had this, this storied life where first it was designed just as, a, as an army missile. The main innovations were, as I said, the, the cylindrical tankage, uh, the better engine, and it had a detachable warhead section. Um, so the thrust unit was the tanks and the engine. Then the body unit uh, contained it was the aft unit, which had control vanes and the avionics, and the, the nose bit of it, which was the warhead, the nuclear warhead. Um, then they wanted to reuse it uh, to test components of the Jupiter missile, hence the name Jupiter-C or Jupiter Composite. It would have a scale model of the Jupiter's uh, re-entry vehicle, as its, as its nose cone. It then had this collection of baby sergeants to get that up to much higher speed, and it then had Jupiter avionics in it. Okay, and we're sitting like this because, of course, we have descent mode on. So let's turn descent mode off. And now we float more normally. All right, so that was highly successful. So anyway, so that's Jupiter C. And in order to get the performance that they needed for Jupiter C, they made two changes. They um, upgraded the engine and made it run on Hydine in liquid oxygen, and Hydine was a combination of UDMH and 
DITA, I forget what DITA stands for. It's diethyl something, presumably. Uh, you know, poisonous stuff, but higher performance. Uh, so yeah, they, they, they had that operating, and then they stretched the tanks some. They also, when they stretched the tanks, they then uh, had to add a second high test peroxide tank uh, to run the gas generator longer. Uh, and that's why you can see some of those engines have one tank and some of those engines have two tanks. So we got almost 10,000 space bucks back. That was good. That was good. Uh, so then we finally get, so then we get to Juno, Juno 1 which basically was identical to Jupiter-C, except it had this small 8-kilogram payload on the final stage instead of a heavier re-entry simulator, re-entry vehicle simulator. Um, but it's broadly similar to, to Jupiter-C. Uh, and finally, we get to Mercury-Redstone. Now, the interesting thing about Mercury-Redstone, and I say Redstone in quotes, because it wasn't actually technically a redstone for a stage. It was the Jupiter C stage with the stretched tanks, but they reverted the engine back to running on ethanol and liquid oxygen for safety because those aren't toxic, uh, whereas hydine is toxic. That meant that they also, I believe, used only one of the two high test peroxide tanks, but they still had both tanks aboard, if memory serves. Um, so just a, an interesting recognition bit on, on the storied history of, of that booster. Okay, so we'd best deal with Jupiter 3. Uh, <laughs> Jupiter. I've been talking about Jupiter a lot, and we're going to Jupiter. Let's deal with Dove 3, which has a Jupiter fine-tuning maneuver. Um, right, so so Little Joe was, was uh, Dove 3. Little Joe was uh, designed to mimic the performance of that of that particular mark of redstone, basically redstone engine but stretched st the the Jupiter C stretch tanks. Uh, Little Joe Two was designed to put the Apollo capsule in its abort system, or in particular, you know, boilerplate Apollo capsule in an abort system uh, under similar stresses to what it would suffer during first stage burn on the Saturn V. Uh, and I think that broadly going on a Saturn 1B would be similar. Uh, so, th to mimic that performance, you know, the, obviously Apollo was rather heavier than Mercury, so they needed much larger solid engine, solid motors to do that. Uh, let's go ahead and align. Right, and it's worth noting that uh, one of the most famous incidents with with Little Joe 2 and Apollo. Now, this test program was designed basically to run the abort system at a specified time or during a specified condition. You note that we did it a bit after max Q, but at a higher thrust weight ratio. So they would want to run it, for example, uh, at max thrust to weight ratio. They'd want to run it uh, at max Q. They'd want to, you know, do a pad abort just to make sure that if from a standing start the thing could get high enough to safely parachute down for for there to be time for the parachutes to open, um, because parachutes take a while to open to fully inflate and to, to slow you down. Um, but the interesting thing about the whole Apollo and Little Joe two series now I forget which test flight this was, but one of them there was actually a failure during the test, so. It was a failure of a failure test. But the amazing thing is, uh, and it was in fact the best test that they could have run, um, was the Little Joe, boost, Little Joe 2 booster started to break apart. Uh, and the Apollo abort system detected this fault, automatically triggered the launch abort system, the capsule separated successfully, uh, and parachuted safely to a splashdown landing. Uh, it was the most perfect test of that abort system you could act, ask for because it was actually a rapidly spiraling failure where the whole thing just started breaking apart. I mean, there's video of it. You can watch it. I, I highly recommend you do watch it because it's pretty amazing. And you can see the little Joe 2 just bursting apart uh, and a, the Apollo capsule and its abort system powering away from it safely, avoided all the debris, avoided any you know minor explosions going on, uh, and then softly landed under its parachutes. 
So that was an excellent test of the Apollo abort system. We did not have a failure on that launch. We uh, we just uh, aborted when we want, wanted to abort. But yes, that was that was an ex. <laughs> they they were actually in many ways lucky in that because that gave, let them actually test the abort detection as well as everything else. So let's go ahead and warp to this if it will let us warp to next maneuver. Yeah, the video of it, and I should mention the video of that of that abort that I've seen. It's part of some some documentary, and they actually talked to the engineers who worked on that abort system, and one of them's recalling how this this all happened, how all this took place. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and focus on Jupiter and perform our correction maneuver. And how are we doing on... Oh, we've got plenty of nitrogen tetroxide and MMH, so we don't have to worry about that. That's good. Okay. All right, now let's look at what we have wrought. Oops, I'm moving. Well, all right, that's acceptable. That should be well within striking distance of Jupiter. Let's look at what our contract says. Ah. Uh, Twenty thousand kilometers, and we're passing within seven thousand kilometers. That's fine. That's acceptable. Uh, the one thing we might want to do, we still don't have perfect alignment there. I'd like to actually move that in a little bit more. That seems unlikely. Um, yeah, but I think we can correct that once we get closer to Jupiter. So let's go ahead and add our usual... We'll do 160 hours out this time. Dove 3 Jupiter. SOI. And that's less than a year. Not bad. Okay, back to the Space Center. And we should quickly do our uh, low Earth orbit test. Now this time the capsule is going to be 300 kilograms lighter than it should be. And the reason for that is that we will lack three human beings in it uh, and all their stuff. So, for that launch abort test, in order to get the abort right, uh, we did put 300 kilograms of lead ballast in. But for this, I don't care enough to actually do that. So, let's see. 
is there anything that we should be setting the VAB to building, given that we are kind of short on cash? Oh, I should see what actually what is in here. I think they're probably just crude speed records from yeah. Just from our sims. They didn't get cleared. Alright. Alright, alright, alright. Now we could launch uh we could launch a high resolution scanner. And that pays decently. That'll we'll probably net uh six out of twenty yeah, it's like fifteen thousand funds. Um Um, so just now I tundra orbit around Earth. Well, we we could do that if we really wanted to, but I guess we, I guess we'll pass for now. Uh, really, what we want to do is just scrape by until we can. Oh, I know what we can do. We'll duplicate that. We'll rename it Labrador Two, so that at least we're building something. We don't have to wait further. Um, and great, uh, that's that's fast to build because I guess it's reusing that command module we just bashed down, or at least we're using some of it. Um, because we're going to want to perform this mission. Fitting, fitting, very fitting. Um, how long do we have? We have six months. I think we'll be able to manage it in six months. And that will give us mucho dollars. Well, funds, whatever they are. Uh, we also need to start hiring some more astronauts. And yeah, so Bobby Deckard was the only one who hasn't flown yet. Um, so let's go ahead and we have spare pilot. Let's get a scientist, an engineer, and a scientist. Now let's go ahead and get a pilot, an engineer and a scientist. Okay, and they all have decently de decent stats for all the good that the stats actually do, which is nothing. Um, okay, so we now have three full crew sets. And that took us down a little bit in terms of payouts, which was not awesome, but acceptable. Uh... What are we doing on hydro? So 49 days until we can unlock the next node of Hydrolox engines. Um, but we'll deal with that in the next episode, I'm sure. Uh, so let's wait until Labrador 1 is ready. And we also probably need to queue up Assuming this flight goes successfully, we will need to queue up our actual first, our actual tr uh, circumlunar test shot. So let's warp till that's ready. Roll it out. Ah, uh, I think we want a day launch for this. How close are we today? Let's see. Uh, okay, so it's early morning. Looks like. Ah, that looks better. All right, so it must have just been an issue with scatter. Occasionally, scatter decides to not scatter or something. 
Um, so, here we go. Let me go ahead and save this again. It's 1961-08-13. So, August, it's August 13th, 1961. Uh, that's about when both the U.S. and the Russians were sending up their first human beings. I think Yuri Gagarin was uh, about a month before. No, he was in, what was he? Like May, June? I should know this by heart, and I don't, and it's annoying. Um, he was 1961, certainly. Um, right, so let's go ahead and launch. We do not want anyone aboard for this launch. We will perform this using automation only. And as you could see from the, my making that narrower version, uh, I also went and applied it to this. So we have a narrower uh, little bulge around it. I didn't bother to make a boost protective cover because, you know, just not really worth it. Um, I like just using that decoupler. Although it would have looked cooler, I think, with a with an actual shroud around the capsule. Basically, I think it would have looked better if this just went out to about here and then went straight up to about here and then came in. But what we have right now is fine. And it's only a minor bulge. Right, so... Um, I think we're going to want a decently high orbit, which we will certainly be able to get with this launch vehicle. That is for sure. Um, a little flickering. Uh, let's look at our contract. So... It wants, okay, a decent orbit, a, circu a fairly circular orbit, 11 days at it. That's if we had crew aboard, which we don't. So, trying to remember what the spec let me refresh myself as to what I decided, I, how I decided I should fly that thing. Catapult C, 90-130-40. However, we're, we are launching to a higher parking orbit, so I think we'll do 90-150-40. Engage autopilot. Zero out that inclination. We're not going to bother to launch it into any specific plane. We're just going to launch. So, in five, four, three, two, one, zero, lift off. Roll program complete. Not really sure why the clouds are flickering today, but that's fine. Pitch program initiated. We appear to have started it a little bit late, but that's okay. Now, remember, we're 300 kilograms light on our payloads, so the Delta V on this launch vehicle is a bit higher than it. Whoa, that's really kind of weird with the clouds. Let's see if that fixes it. Not really. All right, we're going to look up, because I don't know what's wrong with the clouds, but something is, and I don't want anybody to go into an epileptic seizure.
So yeah, once we get to Catapult D, I think what we'll do... These will, these will become NK-33s. And then... We'll widen the second stage out to the full 3.6 meters. And that will work better with our capsule. Did we have a failure? No, we didn't have a failure. Okay. Okay, passing through 45 degrees at 930 meters per second. Forty-four seconds to first stage burnout. Okay, we're now high enough that any abort would uh, be basically in an alternate mode where we'd coast for a while before immediately dropping the chutes. Um, Fifteen seconds to first stage cutout. We're pitching a little bit under prograde to not raise our apogee too much. Five seconds. Enable RCS. And... Burnout. Stage. And ignite. Now we're burning the RCS the whole time. Now we can disengage. Now we can go ahead and pitch up. And we appear to be having a good light on that engine, so let's de uh, remove the launch escape system. Try to align with prograde, more or less. We are going to a slightly higher orbit. Probably end up at something like 220 by 220. Um, I think for the human mission, we do we end up about. 220 by 4 by 380 or so, and then burn the surface module to circularize 380 by 380. Pitch up a little bit more. We're still going fairly slowly. Fifty kilometers. So a bit on abort modes. Um, basically, for a more complicated launch vehicle than something like Mercury Redstone, you're gonna have, and particularly if your capsule has any kind of service module with its own propulsion, you're gonna have a variety of abort modes. Um, Basically, up until you get to a certain altitude, your abort mode involves firing the, uh, the launch escape system, and then as soon as it burns out, deploy the parachutes. Pitch down a little bit. Um, once you get higher, you would be 
firing the launch escape system pu to pull you away, and then you'll coast on up, and then coast on down. Higher yet, and you actually perform a minor suborbital reentry. Uh, and by minor suborbital reentry, don't think it's too gentle. I mean, that famous Soyuz abort, uh, what was it, 19? I, think, I, I forget, no, 7? One of the, um, I forget exactly which. Uh, they suffered something like 19 Gs. And basically permanent back trouble. Uh, it was, it was fairly brutal. Alright, our time to Apogee is decreasing a little bit faster than I'd like, so I'm going to actually maintain our pitch. Um, so, then once you light a stage by which, if the engine fails well, the engine fails, um, it's not so catastrophic and it's unlikely to explode, and even if it did start to explode, um, it wouldn't actually have that much force. Then you can get away with jettisoning your, your launch escape system, your, your abort tower. Um, guess I should have maintained my pitch a little higher. Doesn't actually matter. Um, once you've jettisoned it, uh, and if you have a service module, then you switch to abort mode where if a failure occurs, you simply s shut down the stage that's running, and then you try to perform orbital insertion with your service module if you can. Otherwise, you just use the service module to get far enough away from the second stage and then prepare for re-entry. So, so, for example, in this case, if we had a failure now, we're, we obviously don't have enough delta-v. We have... how much delta-v do we have in this thing? 704 meters per second. So we don't have enough delta V to achieve orbit. We would just use the service propulsion system to get the heck away and then re-enter. Once we clear about seven kilometers per second orbital speed, whoops, let's pitch down. Once we clear that hurdle, then we'll actually be able to abort to orbit. Sorry, once we, once we clear a bit faster than that, because obviously if we abort to orbit, we still need about 60 meters per second to perform a retrofire so we actually can leave orbit again. Alright, I guess I didn't pitch down aggressively enough. Okay. So. Looks like our solar panel survived. That is what I was worried about. That is excellent news. Okay. So. Let's turn this on. Let's extend the antennas, extend the solar panels, and kill our rotation. Now, let's go ahead and warp to Apogee. We, we inserted at Perigee, as always is the case, so we want to warp to Apogee. Well, a little bit before Apogee, so that we have time to perform some knowledge. Okay, and... Interesting. Ah, we have no SAS modules and no... Uh, well, eh, who cares. We have mech chip. Okay, so now we want to perform... So let's first go ahead and stage to enable that engine. Perform a bit of propellant settling. And we should be good now. Ignite the engine, and there we go. 
circularize. Close enough. Okay. Now we want to perform a maneuver that will re-enter us but also increase our velocity as much as possible. So we I think we'll want to re-enter I guess we'll re-enter in the Atlantic and I think we perform the burn about here. So we want to Nope, needs to be lower than that. That's a negative periapsis. Still too low. Now we're getting somewhere. 50. That's about right. All right, so let's perform that maneuver. All right, and we'll turn auto warp off for a reason I'm about to explain, because again, persistent rotation is defaulting to that weird thing where it, it defaults to that being on. The track, you know, body relative rotation when SAS is on, which is somewhat annoying. Okay. Okay, and... Oops, wrong thing. Whoa, 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 what are you doing? Why are you executing that thing here, rather than, you know, where we're supposed to? Ah, uh, that is odd to me. Attitude adjustment, use stock SAS, kill rot. Oh, it can't, can it? All right, so we can't actually... Why is it... Oh, it must be because it... There must be a bug where it executes the thing immediately if you don't have SAS. That is a really odd bug to have, I have to say. Uh, but let's go ahead and warp. The next maneuver we will just spinny, spinny, spinny for a bit. And we want to come out of warp about Right about there. Okay, and let's go ahead and... Oops, no, I think it's negative. I think it's down here. Yes. Okay, perform a bit of ologing. And light it up. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we're gradually increasing our orbital velocity despite lowering our peri perigee. How's this doing? Looking good. Hmm. Oh, that's right. I wasn't having it execute the node. I was doing it manually. Alright, 
let's roll. Here. 272, we have 321 left, that's fine. And what do we want? We want about like a 40. I guess, uh, yeah, the same kind of perigee as before, maybe 35 or 40. Okay, so we're going to have a bit excess in the service module, that'll be fine. Okay, that will do for now. Let's go ahead and burn a little bit more. Oops, no, we want to get closer to prograde, I guess. A little bit higher. Let's try now. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so that's a little bit lower than I would have liked, but within a couple kilometers, it's fine. All right, and so we ended up with only a little bit of aerosene to spare. That's fine. So let's go ahead and, yep, we're flipping inverted. And we want to enable that RCS. Oops. Nope. Heh. <laughs> oh, that was still on. Turn on descent mode. And decouple the service module. And away it goes. Okay. And let's go ahead and line up for re entry. Swap to surface mode just so we can align with the our current heading. And we're going to want to arm the parachute. Because it is very possible we will lose connection during re-entry. Oops, rolled a bit too far. Let's put that on. Caps lock. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and enable this. Let MechJeb line us up. How nice. All right, so far, we are lined up. We are in the upper atmosphere, while I wasn't looking. Our entry velocity is about 600 meters per second higher than it otherwise would be. Let's look at orbit, 8220, maybe 500 meters per second higher than it otherwise normally would. We'll see. Um, and at some point, we will probably lose connection unless we are rather lucky. Uh, oh, actually, we I think we're going to be quite lucky, because we're actually re-entering right over uh, Texas. Or 
or northern Mexico, hard to say. Um, yeah, so we'll actually have coverage for most of this. How nice. Now, that, it, that periapsis is still falling, despite the fact that we have a fair amount of lift. And our descent rate is slowing. That's interesting. We may have chosen a slightly too low per, uh, perigee. But we'll see. Our entry angle, let's compute it. We take the absolute value of the difference between the angle of attack and our current pitch. So 35.6, 32.9. Um, six point seven, and that's two point seven degrees. Unless my math is wrong, that's that's a fairly shallow reentry. That's to be sure. Yes, yeah, shockingly, we still have full oxygen reserves. I wonder how that happened. And there goes the service module. Boom a boom a boom. Can we see it? Where is it? I wonder which wonder where it is. Um Oh, there it is, way down there. Way down there. Okay. So we're using up next to no ablator so far, although we're only just started slowing down. Yeah, it's interesting how form follows function. This, the narrow body version, um, looks very much like the command and service module that I have, pri have previously built um, for the VA ca capsule for my, my Soviet playthrough. Um, Yeah, kind of, it just, it had a, a curved service module instead of a cylinder after the, the shrink down. Um, if I had not shrunk the adapter, if it had stayed at 2.8 meters and then just had a shorter, a short cylindrical service module behind it, small, let, not as wide as the adapter, then it would have looked like the spitting image of Orion, the, the new Orion CEV. Oh good, so the MechJab upgrade has really fixed the issues with the RCS on this, this capsule. So MechJab is holding it rock solid. That's great. I love that. Thank you, Sarbian. Okay, we're about to get positive vertical velocity, it looks like. Remember, our perigee was 30, less than 35 kilometers, our, uh, our entry perigee. Uh, it's looking like what's actually going to happen is we just hit perigee at 62.87 kilometers. Now we're going back up. Still slowing down quite rapidly. If I cared enough, I could roll inverted in. Um, but I don't think I care enough. We'll just we'll just rise up a little bit, perform a little minor skip, and then come back down again. So we 
we've our climb rate is decreasing. We're still moving pretty fast. We're moving about 800 meters per second short of orbital velocity. That's still pretty fast. Over almost six and a half kilometers per second surface relative. Um, probably around, s yeah, just shy of seven inertial. Okay, gradually approaching our apogee. Lift is still continuing to push the apogee a little bit higher. Just a little bit. Probably hit about 73 kilometers. Okay, downwards we come. Check the map. That's interesting. We went well past Texas. We're now passing over the Cape. And we're going to end in the mid Atlantic. You know, right, actually, right, a bit north of the Caribbean, really. That's not going to be hard for the recovery ship at all. Yeah, this was this was a this was a test flight with flying colors. Really nice, really really nice. We didn't even hit that much of a G load. I mean, our yeah, our max G was on ascent. I'd like it if our ascent max G were lower than 4.9, but I don't really see a way for that to happen. Whoa. The game crashed. That's... That's interesting. That's my first crash in 1.1.3. That has just never happened before in 1.1.3. That's pretty amazing. Um, well, I mean, we knew that was going to end fine, so that's not a that's not really a worry. Um, so yeah, given that it's actually quite late already. Um, I think that that is the game telling me that, hey, you really ought to go to bed now. So I think I'm going to listen to it. Uh, so thank you everyone for watching. Uh, I'm sorry that we ended on a bit of a downer. Um, but yeah, I'll just, I'll finish that re-entry uh, and we won't waste everybody's time re-watching it. Uh, because you've already, I mean, you've seen like three lunar re-entries already. So a low Earth orbit re-entry is not a big deal. Um, but yeah, as you can see, that, that went swimmingly, went with flying colors, um, so we'll be ready to send up a cr an actual human crew in the next episode. Uh, so until then, thank you everyone for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoy the episode. I hope that it was helpful to you, that you learned something, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. So yeah, so if we're at all in doubt about our re-entry velocity, um, we can stay we can stay inverted in the upper atmosphere to push that perigee down and then we'll end up hanging around 50 to 47 kilometers instead of higher or instead of doing a skip back up to 80 kilometers and yeah 
Okay, so I feel I feel comfortable with this pod, uh, with its capabilities. So we're going to go ahead and actually launch some stuff for real, which is presumably what you've actually been waiting for. Although hopefully this this section uh, was actually helpful to you in terms of your own lunar reentries. Um, we'll obviously do that for real at some point soon, but doing it for real doesn't mean we have the freedom. We, we wouldn't have the freedom of a simulation where I can try stuff out, where I can talk about different approaches. We can just reset the sim and try again. Uh, so hopefully this was this was helpful to you. All right, so that's that's acceptable. Look at that. We're staying above forty. So the, the secret is assuming your crew can take it. That's 7.5 Gs. Assuming your crew can take it and assuming your shield can survive that peak heat flux, which I didn't even see what temperature we got to, but obviously we stayed under 3,000. Um, long as you can take that, it's better to, to do a lower perigee, higher G, and get the lower heat load and therefore lower ablator use. If you don't have ablator, of course, if you're in the space shuttle, then obviously you have to take a different approach. Um, you have to try to do it in, in radiative equilibrium. But that's not an option for us on a lunar reentry. Okay. So coming up, we have the launch abort test. So let's warp to that. That was a long warp. Uh, in fact, it was such a long warp that we're going to have to do our first Jupiter fine-tune maneuver <laughs> before doing the other thing. All right, so for this, no crew aboard. We're going to do a separation at max Q, which is going to be, I think, fairly close to max G. Yeah, so we've... Our climb rate is decreasing. We're still moving pretty fast. We're moving about 800 meters per second short of orbital velocity. That's still pretty fast. Over almost six and a half kilometers per second surface relative. Um, probably around, s yeah, just shy of seven inertial. Okay, gradually approaching our apogee. Lift is still continuing to push the apogee a little bit higher. Just a little bit. Probably hit about 73 kilometers. Okay, downwards we come. Check the map. That's interesting. We went well past Texas. We're now passing over the Cape. And we're going to end in the mid Atlantic. You know, right, actually, right, a bit north of the Caribbean, really. That's not going to be hard for the recovery ship at all. 
Yeah, this was this was a this was a test flight with flying colors. Really nice, really really nice. We didn't even hit that much of a G load. I mean, our yeah, our max G was on ascent. I'd like it if our ascent max G were lower than 4.9, but I don't really see a way for that to happen. Let's try 60. Whoa, nope. Okay, 60. Come on. Why is... There we are. Oh, this is going to be bad because I'm not going to get oriented properly in time. Okay. Good enough. So we're coming in to a quite high perigee. Our entry angle, let's compute this. 34.74 angle of attack, pitch is 39.6, so that's 4.9 degrees? Yeah, 4.9 degrees entry angle. So that's a very shallow entry angle. I'm not even sure whether that's within Apollo's reentry corridor. And again, we're coming in at 11.165, which I'm fairly sure is at least 100 meters per second faster than Apollo ever did. But I'm sure uh, that uh, pe <laughs> people who know their Apollo missions better than I can correct me on that one. All right, we just need to keep broadly aligned, damp out any kind of... Okay, and I need to watch that speed like a hawk. So yeah, the, like I was saying, the, the, the skipping out of the atmosphere problem for Apollo was because, remember, we're still at escape velocity. So if we came in really shallow, we would, the Earth wouldn't slow us down enough. Because remember, when you're coming back from the moon, if you burn hard enough, you will escape the Earth-Moon system. Uh, and they did burn hard enough to do that. Whoa, whoops. I was, was not paying attention to my vertical velocity, so this started a bit late. Basically, up until you get to a certain altitude, your abort mode involves firing the, the launch escape system, and then as soon as it burns out, deploy the parachutes. Pitch down a little bit. Um, once you get higher, you would be firing the launch escape system pu to pull you away, and then you'll coast on up, and then coast on down. Higher yet, and you actually perform a minor suborbital reentry. Uh, and by minor suborbital reentry, don't think it's too gentle. I mean, that famous Soyuz abort, uh, what was it, 19? I, I, I forget, no, 7? One of the, um, I forget exactly which. Uh, they suffered something like 19 Gs. And basically permanent back trouble. Uh, it was, it was fairly brutal. Alright, our time to Apogee is decreasing a little bit faster than I'd like, so I'm going to actually maintain our pitch. Um, so, then once you light a stage by which, if the engine fails well, the engine fails, um, it's not so catastrophic, and it's unlikely to explode, and even if it did start to explode, um, it wouldn't actually have that much force. Then you can get away 
with jettisoning your your launch escape system your your board tower i guess i should maintain my pitch a little higher doesn't actually matter once you've jettisoned it uh... and if you have a service module then you switch to abort mode where if a failure occurs you simply shut down the stage that's running and then you try to perform orbital insertion with your service module if you can otherwise you just use the service module to get far enough away from the second stage and then prepare for re-entry so in so for example in this case if we had a failure now we're, we obviously don't have enough delta v we have how much delta v do we have in this thing 704 meters per second so we don't have enough delta v to achieve orbit we would just use the service propulsion system to get the heck away and then re-enter once we clear about seven kilometers per second orbital speed whoops let's pitch down once we clear that hurdle then we'll actually be able to abort to orbit sorry once we once we clear a bit faster than that because obviously if we abort to orbit we still need about sixty meters per second to perform a retrofire so we actually can leave orbit again all right i guess i didn't two twenty by four by three eighty or so and then burn the service module to circularize three eighty by three eighty pitch up a little bit more we're still going fairly slowly hundred and fifty kilometers so a bit on abort modes um, Basically, for a more complicated launch vehicle than something like Mercury or Redstone, you're going to have, and particularly if your capsule has any kind of service module with its own propulsion, you're going to have a variety of abort modes. Um, basically, up until you get to a certain altitude, your abort mode involves firing the uh, the launch escape system and then as soon as it burns out deploy the parachutes pitch down a little bit um, once you get higher you would be firing the launch escape system pu to pull you away and then you'll coast on up and then coast on down higher yet and you actually perform a minor suborbital reentry uh, and by minor suborbital reentry, don't think it's too gentle. I mean that famous Soyuz abort. Uh, what was it? 19? I, I, I forget. No, seven. One of the. Um, I forget exactly which. Uh, they suffered something like 19 Gs, and basically permanent back trouble. Uh, it was it was fairly brutal. All right, our time to apogee is decreasing a little bit faster than I'd like, so I'm going to actually maintain our pitch. Um, so, then once you light a stage by which, if the engine fails well, the engine fails, um, it's not so catastrophic and it's unlikely to explode, and even if it did start to explode, um, it wouldn't actually have that much force, then you can get away with jettisoning your, your launch escape system, your, your abort tower. Um, guess I should have maintained my pitch a little higher. Doesn't actually matter. Um, once you've jettisoned it, uh, and if you have a service module, then you switch to abort mode where if a failure occurs, you simply s shut down the state. Basically, for a more complicated launch vehicle than something like Mercury or Redstone, you're going to have, and particularly if your capsule has any kind of service module with its own propulsion you're going to have a variety of abort modes. Um,
basically up until you get to a certain altitude your abort mode involves firing the the launch escape system and then as soon as it burns out deploy the parachutes pitch down a little bit um, once you get higher you would be firing the launch escape system pu to pull you away and then you'll coast on up and then coast on down higher yet and you actually perform a minor suborbital reentry. Uh, and by minor suborbital reentry, don't think it's too gentle. I mean, that famous Soyuz abort, uh, what was it, 19? I, I, I forget, no, 7? One of the, um, I forget exactly which. Uh, they suffered something like 19 Gs. And basically permanent back trouble. Uh, it was It was fairly brutal. All right, our time to apogee is decreasing a little bit faster than I'd like, so I'm going to actually maintain our pitch. Um, so then, once you light a stage by which, if the engine fails well, the engine fails, um, it's not so catastrophic, and it's unlikely to explode, and even if it did start to explode, um, it wouldn't actually have that much force. Then you can get away with jettisoning your, your launch escape system, your, your abort tower. Um, Guess I should have maintained my pitch a little higher. Doesn't actually matter. Um, once you've jettisoned it, uh, and if you have a service module, then you switch to abort mode where if a failure occurs, you simply s shut down the stage that's running, and then you try to perform orbital insertion with your service module if you can. Otherwise, you just use the service module to get far enough away from the second stage and then prepare for re-entry. So, in, so, for example, in this case, if we had a failure now, we're, we obviously don't have enough delta V. We have... how much delta V do we have in this thing? 704 meters per second. So we don't have enough delta V to achieve orbit. We would just use the service propulsion system to get the heck away and then re-enter. Once we clear about 7 kilometers per second orbital speed, So we our climb rate is decreasing. We're still moving pretty fast. We're moving about 800 meters per second short of orbital velocity. That's still pretty fast. Over almost six and a half kilometers per second surface relative. Um, probably around, s yeah, just shy of seven inertial. Okay, gradually approaching our apogee. Lift is still continuing to push the apogee a little bit higher. Just a little bit. Probably hit about 73 kilometers. Okay, downwards we come. Check the map. 
That's interesting. We went well past Texas. We're now passing over the Cape. And we're going to end in the mid-Atlantic. You know, right, actually, right, a bit north of the Caribbean, really. That's not going to be hard for the recovery ship at all. Yeah, this was this was a this was a test flight with flying, presumably because the drag was too severe. Uh so that seemed highly successful. So we're right about at Apogee. We've now started our descent. We're gonna turn these on, turn descent mode on and actually try to stabilize this thing and pretend like it's for reals. Okay. Let's roll properly. All right, and I think we're going to... Oh, ha <laughs> ha That's why everything's happening, because autopilot was still engaged. I forgot that part. All right, so we're still subsonic. Yeah, so it, it is ironic that the launch vehicle we built for this looks a lot like Little Joe 2, with, with those fins and with it being f short and stout. Um, the difference, of course, is that that was a liquid stage, and both the original Little Joe designed for Mercury and Little Joe 2 used for Apollo um, were clusters of solid motors. Uh, in, li in Mercury's Little Joe case, they were four casters uh, with some recruits for extra liftoff thrust. And in the case of Little Joe, Joe 2, I believe they were algols, which were used as, I think it's the first stage of the Scout launch vehicle. Um, forget exactly what Little Joe 2 used. But basically, the, the main idea behind both the original Little Joe and Little Joe 2 is you design a super, super cheap, solid, entirely solid propellant launch vehicle. Because, of course, at that time, they didn't feel that solids were safe enough for crude spaceflight. Um, I think with some justification, frankly. Um... Okay, we're coming up just about to shoot deployment. And you did so you design this this launch vehicle that basically mimics the performance of the actual booster you're going to use. In Mercury's case, it was the Redstone. They basically quite precisely mimic the performance characteristics of the Redstone using um, little Joe's set of solid motors. Okay, we have Drogue full deployment slowing down to about 80 meters per second. And we have main semi-deployment and main full deployment. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and warp to Apogee. We, we inserted at perigee, as always is the case, so we want to warp to apogee. Well, a little bit before apogee, so that we have time to perform some knowledge. Okay, and... Interesting. Ah, we have no SAS modules and no... Uh, well... Eh, who cares? We have mech chip. Okay, so now we want to perform So let's first go ahead and stage to enable that engine. Perform a bit of propellant settling. And we should be good now. Ignite the engine, and there we go. Circularize. Close enough. Okay. Now, we want to perform a maneuver 
that will re-enter us but also increase our velocity as much as possible. So we I think we'll want to re-enter I guess we'll re-enter in the Atlantic and I think we perform the burn about here. So we want to One twenty five. Nope, needs to be lower than that. That's a negative periapsis. Still too low. Now we're getting somewhere. 50, that's about right. All right, so let's perform that maneuver. All right, and that will give us mucho dollars. Well, funds, whatever they are. Uh, we also need to start hiring some more astronauts. And... Yeah, so Bobby Deckard was the only one who hasn't flown yet. Um, so let's go ahead and we have spare pilot. Let's get a scientist, an engineer, and a scientist. Now let's go ahead and get a pilot, an engineer and a scientist. Okay, and they all have decently de decent stats for all the good that the stats actually do, which is nothing. Um, okay, so we now have three full crew sets. And that took us down a little bit in terms of payouts, which was not awesome, but acceptable. Uh, what are we doing on hydro? So 49 days until we can unlock the next node of Hydrolox engines. Um, but we'll deal with that in the next episode, I'm sure. Uh, so let's wait until Labrador 1 is ready. And we also probably need to queue up Assuming this flight goes successfully, we will need to queue up our actual first, our actual tr uh, circumlunar test shot. So let's warp until that's ready. Roll it out. Ah, uh, I think we want a day launch for this. How close are we today? Let's see. Uh, okay, so it's early morning. Looks like. Ah, that looks better. All right, so it must have just been an issue with Scatter. Best deal with Jupiter 3? Uh, <laughs> Jupiter. I've been talking about Jupiter a lot, and we're going to Jupiter. Let's deal with Dove 3, which has a Jupiter fine-tuning maneuver. Uh, right, so so Little Joe was... was uh, Dove 3. Little Joe was... Uh, designed to mimic the performance of that of that particular mark of redstone, basically redstone engine but stretched the, the Jupiter C stretch tanks 
Uh, Little Joe 2 was designed to put the Apollo capsule in its abort system, or in particular, you know, a boilerplate Apollo capsule in an abort system, uh, under similar stresses to what it would suffer during first stage burn on the Saturn V. Uh, and I think that broadly going on a Saturn 1B would be similar. Uh, so to mimic that performance, you know, the, obviously Apollo was rather heavier than Mercury, so they needed much larger solid engine, solid motors to do that. Uh, let's go ahead and align. Right, and it's worth noting that uh, one of the most famous incidents with with Little Joe 2 and Apollo. Now, this test program was designed basically to run the abort system at a specified time or during a specified condition. You note that we did it a bit after max Q, but at a higher thrust weight ratio. So they would want to run it, for example, uh, at max thrust to weight ratio. They'd want to run it uh, at max Q. They'd want to, you know, do a pad abort just to make sure that if from a standing start the thing could get high enough to safely parachute down for for there to be time for the parachutes to open, um, because parachutes take a while to open to fully inflate and to, to slow you down. Um, but the interesting thing about the whole Apollo and Little Joe two series now I forget which test flight this was, but one of them there was actually a failure during the test, so. It was a failure of a failure test. But the amazing thing is, uh, and it was in fact the best test that they could have run, um, was the Little Joe, boost, Little Joe 2 booster started to break apart. Uh, and the Apollo abort system detected this fault, automatically triggered the launch abort system. The capsule separated successfully uh, and parachuted safely to a splashdown landing. Uh, it was the most perfect test of that abort system you could act, ask for because it was actually a rapidly spiraling failure where the whole thing just started breaking apart. I mean, you, there's video of it. You can watch it. I, I highly recommend you do watch it because it's pretty amazing. And you can see the little Joe 2 just bursting apart. Uh, and a, the Apollo, you have to try to do it in, in radiative equilibrium. But that's not an option for us on a lunar reentry. Okay. So, coming up, we have the launch abort test. So, let's work to that. That was a long warp. Uh, In fact, it was such a long warp that we're going to have to do our first Jupiter fine-tune maneuver <laughs> before doing the other thing. All right, so for this, no crew aboard. We're going to do a separation at max Q, which is going to be, I think, fairly close to max G. Okay, so here's our version of Little Joe 2. It's using a, a full-up uh, LR-79 instead of anything else we might be doing. Um, it doesn't precisely replicate the first stage of either of our launch vehicles. But, but it does give us a decent amount of delta V. It gives us decent thrust to weight ratio. So let's go ahead and uh, I think we're going to want 80, 120, 40 is fine. All right, engage the autopilot and we're going to watch that dynamic pressure indicator. So up we go. Roll program initiated. 
Now I apologize that this is running at basically half speed. Um, that's because there's an issue with Pack Life Support where it's spamming the log every frame. As oh oh no, there is not. I don't know why we're running at half speed, given that uh, there isn't any aboard anybody aboard, so it's not a Pack Life issue. All right, so we're at 10,000 kilopascals dynamic pressure. I think we're going to want a decently high orbit, which we will certainly be able to get with this launch vehicle. That is for sure. Um, a little flickering. Uh, let's look at our contract. So it wants okay a decent orbit, a, circu a fairly circular orbit, 11 days at it. That's if we had crew aboard, which we don't. So, trying to remember what the spec, let me refresh myself as to what I decided, I, how I decided I should fly that thing. Catapult C, 90, 130, 40. However, we're, we are launching to a higher parking orbit, so I think we'll do 90, 150, 40. Engage autopilot, zero out that inclination. We're not going to bother to launch it into any specific plane, we're just going to launch. So, In five, four, three, two, one, zero, lift off. Roll program complete. Not really sure why the clouds are flickering today, but that's fine. Pitch program initiated. We appear to have started it a little bit late, but that's okay. Now, remember, we're 300 kilograms light on our payloads, so the delta V on this launch vehicle is a bit higher than it. Whoa, that's really kind of weird with the clouds. Let's see if that fixes it. Not really. All right, we're going to look up, because I don't know what's wrong with the clouds, but something is. Why are you executing that thing here, rather than, you know, where we're supposed to? Ah, uh, that is odd to me. Attitude adjustment, use stock SAS, kill rot. Oh, it can't, can it? All right, so we can't actually... Why is it... Oh, it must be because it... There must be a bug where it executes the thing immediately if you don't have SAS. That is a really odd bug to have, I have to say. Uh, but let's go ahead and warp. The next maneuver will just spinny, spinny, spinny for a bit. And we want to come out of warp about Right about there. Okay, and let's go ahead and... Oops, no, I think it's negative. I think it's down here. Yes. Okay, 
perform a bit of ologing and light it up. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we're gradually increasing our orbital velocity despite lowering our peri perigee. How's this doing? Looking good. Hmm. Oh, that's right. I wasn't having it execute the node. I was doing it manually. at that is because we are using the lift of the pod we went in deep and then we used the lift of the pod to get us out of the deep atmosphere again uh, that's not to say that you can't do a re-entry with a purely ballistic like you can't do a purely ballistic re-entry that doesn't go into the atmosphere leave the atmosphere and re-enter the atmosphere that's possible it's harder but it's possible uh, which means that the whole um, skipping thing doesn't quite work. Most of it's just orbital mechanics. Like, if you have... Say our orbit went like this, only went down to about 100 kilometers, then we'd go, even if we went in ballistic, we'd go in, we'd go out again, we'd go around, and we'd come back in again. Uh, that's really more like... Uh, what would you call it? Uh, that, that's really more like an arrow breaking orbit than a skip re-entry. Uh, the reason that when you talk about Apollo, you talk about people worrying about the pod just skipping out of the atmosphere is not, again, not because it's it's skipping like a stone and it'll come back. It's because if you don't um, get low enough, then you'll run out of supplies as you complete your, like, you know, Eight hour or one day orbit that bring that finally brings you back. Um, that's the worry there. I mean, also the worry is that generally you can't you, with those kind of orbits with Apollo's orbit trajectories to minimize time in the Earth's uh, radiation belts. They would come in much faster, and that's why remember that's why I went up of over 11 kilometers per second. Um, let's go ahead and do this. What did we? 3600, I think, is what we chose. Up. And we want... Oh, that's way too high. Let's try 60. Whoa, nope. Okay, 60. Come on. Why is... There we are. Oh, this is going to be bad because I'm not going to get oriented properly in time. Okay. Good enough. So we're coming in to a quite high perigee. Our entry angle, and we should quickly do our uh, low Earth orbit test. Now this time the capsule is going to be 300 kilograms lighter than it should be. And the reason for that is that we will lack three human beings in it uh, and all their stuff. So, 
for that launch abort test, in order to get the abort right, uh, we did put 300 kilograms of lead ballast in. But for this, I don't care enough to actually do that. So, let's see. Is there anything that we should be setting the VAB to building, given that we are kind of short on cash? Oh, I should see what actually what is in here. I think they're probably just crude speed records from, yeah, just from our sims. They didn't get cleared. All right. All right, all right, all right. Now... We could launch uh, we could launch a high resolution scanner and that pays decently. That'll we'll probably net uh, six out of twenty you know, something like fifteen thousand funds. Um, um mm -hmm. so line tundra orbit around Earth. Well we we could do that if we really wanted to, but I guess we I guess we'll pass for now. Uh, really, what we want to do is just scrape by until we can... Oh, I know what we can do. We'll duplicate that. We'll rename it Labrador 2, so that at least we're building something. We don't have to wait further. Um... And great, uh, that's that's fast to build because I guess it's reusing that command module we just bashed down, or at least reusing some of it. Um, because we're going to want to perform this mission. Fitting, fitting, very fitting. Um, how long do we have? We have six months. I think we'll be able to manage it in six months. And that will give us mucho dollars. Well, funds, whatever they are. Uh, we also need to start hiring some more astronauts out of 20, you know, something like 15,000 funds. Um, um, just an ally tundra orbit around Earth. Well, we we could do that if we really wanted to, but I guess we I guess we'll pass for now. Uh, really, what we want to do is just scrape by until we can. Oh, I know what we can do. We'll duplicate that. We'll rename it Labrador Two, so that at least we're building something. We don't have to wait further. Um, and great, uh, that's that's fast to build because I guess it's reusing that command module we just bashed down, or at least reusing some of it, um, because we're going to want to perform this mission. Fitting, fitting, very fitting. Um, how long do we have? We have six months. I think we'll be able to manage it in six months. And that will give us mucho dollars. Well, funds, whatever they are. Uh, we also need to start hiring some more astronauts. And yeah, so Bobby Deckard was the only one who hasn't flown yet. Um, so let's go ahead and we have spare pilot. Let's get a scientist, an engineer, and a scientist. Now let's go ahead and get a pilot, an engineer, and a scientist. Okay, and they all have decently de decent stats for all the good that the stats actually do, which is nothing. Um, okay, so we now have three full crew sets. 
and that took us down a little bit in terms of payouts, which was not awesome, but acceptable. Uh, what are we doing on Hydra? So 49 days until we can unlock the next node of Hydrolox engines. Um, but we'll deal with that in the next episode, I'm sure. Uh, so let's wait until Labrador 1 is ready. And try to perform orbital insertion with your service module if you can. Otherwise, you just use the service module to get far enough away from the second stage and then prepare for re-entry. So, in, so, for example, in this case, if we had a failure now, we're, we obviously don't have enough delta-v. We have... how much delta-v do we have in this thing? 704 meters per second. So we don't have enough delta-v to achieve orbit. We would just use the service propulsion system to get the heck away and then re-enter. Once we clear about 7 kilometers per second orbital speed... Whoops. Let's pitch down. Once we clear that hurdle, then we'll actually be able to abort to orbit. Sorry, once we, once we clear a bit faster than that, because obviously if we abort to orbit, we still need about 60 meters per second to perform a retrofire so we actually can leave orbit again. All right, I guess I didn't pitch down aggressively enough. Okay. So. Looks like our solar panels survived. That is what I was worried about. That is excellent news. Okay. So. Let's turn this on. Let's extend the antennas, extend the solar panels, and kill our rotation. Now, let's go ahead and warp to Apogee. We, we inserted at Perigee, as always is the case, so we want to warp to Apogee. Well, a little bit before Apogee, so that we have time to perform some knowledge. Okay, and... Interesting. Ah, we have no SAS modules and no... Uh, well, eh, who cares. So, for that launch abort test, in order to get the abort right, uh, we did put 300 kilograms of lead ballast in. But for this, I don't care enough to actually do that. So, let's see. Is there anything that we should be setting the VAB to building, given that we are kind of short on cash? Oh, I should see what actually... what is in here. I think they're probably just crude speed records from... yeah. Just from our sims. They didn't get cleared. Alright. Alright, alright, alright. Now, we could launch, uh, we could launch a high-resolution scanner, and that pays decently. That'll, we'll probably net, uh, six out of twenty, you know, something like fifteen thousand funds. Um, um and tundra orbit around Earth. Well, we we could do that if we really wanted to, but I guess we I guess we'll pass for now. Uh, really, what we want to do is just scrape by until we can. 
Oh, I know what we can do. We'll duplicate that. We'll rename it Labrador 2 so that at least we're building something. We don't have to wait further. Um, and great, uh, that's that's fast to build because I guess it's reusing that command module we just bashed down, or at least we're using some of it. Um, because we're going to want to perform this mission. Fitting, fitting, very fitting. Um, how long do we have? We have six months. I think we'll be able to manage it in six months. And that will give us mucho dollars. Well, funds, whatever they are. Uh, we also need to start hiring some more astronauts. And... Yeah, so Bobby Deckard was the only one who hasn't flown yet. Um, so let's go ahead and we have spare pilot. Let's get a science, an engineer. Is heating right? All right. Yeah, that's that's a fairly high G load. Not gonna lie. 7.3. Alright, now we roll inverted and hold it this altitude if we can. Alright, it looks like now we can go ballistic. Or we can stay here for a while, decrease that sink rate. Alright. Now we'll roll again. Come back down again. Alright, I think we can just actually let it go ballistic for now. All right, yeah, so this is ending up with less ablator use than before. That's for sure. Higher peak Gs. So you definitely can see, despite the fact... Oh, scary, scary, scary low perigee. You know, this is a super aggressive reentry, except we're actually using less ablator than before. Um, you who try to do reentries, even in stock Kerbal Space Program, that is a lesson that you need to learn, that it's not, it's not an intuitive lesson. But it is a lesson you need to learn in terms of how reentry actually works. All right, I think now we can stay like this for a bit. Okay, now let's go back to ballistic. Uh, when I say let's go back to a ballistic entry, we're not really doing a ballistic entry. We're spinning, and that means that the lift forces will cancel each other out every revolution we do. So in effect, over time, averaged, we're doing a ballistic re-entry. Because we, now we have some positive lift, then we're going to have some lift out to the side, then we're going to have some negative lift, then we're going to have lift out to the other side. Yep, look at that ablator. It's not really going to go much below 40. So yeah, so if we're at all in doubt about our reentry velocity, um, we can stay we can stay inverted in the upper atmosphere to push that perigee down. Same kind of perigee as before, maybe 35 or 40. Okay, so we're going to have a bit excess in the service module. That'll be fine.
Okay, that will do for now. Let's go ahead and burn a little bit more. Oops, no, we want to get closer to prograde, I guess. A little bit higher. Let's try now. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so that's a little bit lower than I would have liked, but within a couple kilometers, it's fine. All right, and so we ended up with only a little bit of aerosene to spare. That's fine. So let's go ahead and, yep, we're flipping inverted. And we want to enable that RCS. Oops. Nope. <laughs> oh, that was still on. Turn on descent mode. And decouple the service module. And away it goes. Okay. And let's go ahead and line up for re-entry. Swap to surface mode just so we can align with the our current heading. And we're going to want to arm the parachute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we're gradually increasing our orbital velocity despite lowering our perigee. How's this doing? Looking good. Hmm? Oh, that's right. I wasn't having it execute the node. I was doing it manually. Seventy-two. We have three twenty-one left. That's fine. And what do we want? We want about like a forty. I guess a. Yeah, the same kind of perigee as before. Maybe thirty-five or forty. So we're going to have a bit excess in the service module. That'll be fine. Okay, that will do for now. Let's go ahead and burn a little bit more. Oops, no, we want to get closer to prograde, I guess. 